with me in your Bibles today to Mark chapter 10, if you would. And the title of this morning's message is Asking the Right Questions. You know, many people have questions for God. Uh, I had already prepared uh, this morning's message, and Lori and I were watching a movie last night uh, called, uh, it was on Netflix, called Full Count. And uh, it's about a, a young man uh, and, who's a pitcher and, and uh, struggles with dad on the farm and just the different things that happened. Um, but something really bad happened right at the start of the movie, and the sheriff of the town in his despair asked a question that many people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a question that uh, is even asked by many throughout the Bible. Uh, uh, Jeremiah writes, why, why do the wicked prosper? David writes, why do the wicked prosper? Why does it seem to go good for bad people? And the rest of us trying to walk with Jesus, life isn't so tough. It, I don't think anyone here has ever felt that before. But, but many ask those questions. There's other questions that people ask regarding God or questions they have for God. Why is there so much suffering in the world if God is real? I've got an answer for all these, but it would take a sermon to answer each one. But, but I, and I, I never want to be trite with these answers. These are deep answers that people struggle with. And if they don't come to a proper answer of these questions, they give up, they listen to the voice of hell that says, why, why even bother? Jesus asked the disciples one time when everybody was bailing on him, will you guys leave too? And Peter said one of the smartest things he ever said. He said, Jesus, where else are we going to go? You're the only one that's got words of life. I, let me say to you, anytime you're thinking of cashing in your chips, as it were, you don't know what that means because none of you have ever been to Vegas or anything, but <laughs> cashing in your chips, uh, saying you're done with it all, you... And I'd heard this from people years ago when I tried God. I don't know how you try God, like I tried a new shirt. But any of you that ever feel like I've had enough, where else are you going to go? I guarantee you there is nothing better than Jesus, no matter how enticing it, it looks. And there's a voice that plays in our heads sometimes that says, you know what, you might as well give up. Well, I think that, that, that voice, which sounds like you, but it's really the great ventriloquist Satan... Uh, I think that voice is partially correct. I think we do need to give up. We need to learn how to give up and turn our lives completely over to Jesus. There's time to, to melt as a puddle, go, Jesus, I just can't go on. I don't know what to do. I'm looking to you. And you lay there till he raises you up. Are you with me so far? Yes. We, we go through struggles in life, and people have many questions for God. How about this one? Why would a loving God send people to hell? Can I just answer very quickly? Again, I don't mean to sound trite. He doesn't send anybody to hell. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. People go because they are hell-bent on following Satan and his ways and rejecting God. That's the only way anybody gets there, that you have to physically push Jesus out of the way to get to hell. It takes a lot of work. When the easiest thing to do is to surrender and say, Lord Jesus, you came to bring life. I, I want life. I... I you know, I didn't answer my, my two-second answer, and I almost hesitate to do it. Why is there so much suffering in the world? I was, I was uh, on a motorcycle trip with a friend, and we, we uh, visited another friend uh, in, in the Rockies in Colorado, in the middle of nowhere. And he, this friend in Colorado isn't saved. A guy I really love, though, and we have a great relationship. And uh, he doesn't talk, talk much about God, doesn't want to go there. But he brings up to me one of the last times we saw one another this very question. If there's a God, why is there so much suffering? And I took a little bit of time just to try to explain it, more time than I'm going to take here. But can I just say the reason there's suffering is because of Satan. He is the author of suffering. And so often the ventriloquist will speak into our ears, why would God do this? Why would God allow this? Because he wants to deflect the, the attention off of himself. Satan is the one that causes all pain, all suffering, all sickness, all diseases. He is under the feet of Jesus. His power has been broken, but he's still thrashing around here on earth until his day comes and his day will come. Don't give up hope. Don't quit believing. 
because God is there. How about this question? People go through hard things, and, and have you ever heard this question? Maybe you've asked, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? What did I do? Is God mad at me? Why is this happening to me? If you ever read the book of Job, that question is asked numerous times. Job asks. But I find it interesting that God never answers the question. But he asks Job some questions at the end. And Job is healed as he obeys what God is saying. Now, even saying that, some of you can go, I'm going through all sorts of things I mustn't be obeying. Don't go, don't go down that road. Go down this road. Well, I'm going to ask some right questions towards the end, but let me just let you in on a little bit. Ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? God, what, what do you have for me in this place? No matter how bad that place is. What, one of my favorite questions was asked of Billy Graham. And if you ever come to my office, it's in a frame on my bookcase. I have to put things on the bookcases. I got probably three or four more times bookcase than I have books to put on them. So I put some pictures and different things on them. But I have this one, and it was a question asked Billy Graham, uh, and this is how it went. Someone asked him, if Christianity is real, why is there so much evil in the world? Fair question. Billy answered, with so much soap, why are there so many dirty people in the world? He concludes the statement by saying, Christianity, like soap, must be applied if it's to make a difference in our lives. It's got to be applied. Lori and I have been applying Jesus and the soap of the Spirit for decades. I don't know how many years it is. It was September of 1973 that a friend came to, to my college class and said, you know what, my boyfriend and I, we've given our hearts to Jesus. Now, Lori and I grew up in the church. But it wasn't that we were necessarily walking with Jesus. And when I had a friend give a testimony, she didn't intend to. She just told me matter-of-factly. Man, it caused something to shake on the inside. We better get our hearts right with Jesus. We got our hearts right with Jesus. Now, I, I don't want to tell you we are saints uh, the next day. But it was a growing thing. It began with the decision, Jesus, I'm going to walk with you. And we've been walking with him ever since. Would I trade a day of that for anything else? No. How about all the money in the world? No. Money comes and money goes. How about things? Things come and things go. How about experiences? Experiences come, experiences go. But a relationship with Jesus is eternal and it lasts forever. You wake up in the morning with peace, you go to bed with peace, and when you don't have peace, you can go to someone who is the Prince of Peace and he will give you peace and rest your soul no matter what your circumstances. How many of you are glad that we got Jesus in our lives? There's nothing quite like him in all the earth. Well, this brings us to Mark chapter 10. Verse 32, can, can we uh, uh, read some scripture today? I think it's good for us to go to the word of God. That is our foundation for everything. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 32, says this. Now they were on the road, this is Jesus and his disciples, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were, Jesus wasn't amazed, his disciples were, and those with him. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, you're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. It's a sobering journey that they are on. It isn't fun, it isn't laughter, it's a sobering journey. And, and the disciples, it says, first of all, that they were amazed. They were amazed because the religious leaders and the political leaders had conspired to find some way to kill Jesus, to get him out of the way. He was causing problems politically. He was causing problems for the religious leaders. People weren't showing up at the temple as much anymore. They were going out to see Jesus. We can't have that happen. They were conspiring together. 
So the, the disciples are amazed. Why in the world are we going to Jerusalem, which is the capital of, of, of the nation, the political center, the religious center with the temple? These guys want you. Why in the world would you go there? Being coronavirus friendly, I cough into my elbow and not my hand. So, so we want to uh, we want to be careful. May, may I say about this? I, I joke just a um, little bit of dark humor. Pray, pray for the health of the world, for people, etc. Don't ever think it's somewhere else and it won't happen to me. Pray for people. Pray for God's healing touch upon our land and upon the nations. So they're amazed, but they're also afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they're not stupid. They know that the authorities are after their master. They're after Jesus, and they get a hold of him, and they do something to him. A good chance they're going to receive some of the fallout, and it won't go well for them either. So they're walking to Jerusalem, both amazed and afraid. And so Jesus takes them aside, takes the 12 aside from the multitude. And he says to them, look, guys, I want to tell you what's going to happen. He's, he's forewarning. Uh, we've heard it said before, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. To be forewarned is to be ready for what's going to be happening. So you're not broadsided or blindsided. So he says to them, I'm going to be betrayed. They'll mock him. They will, they, they will, they will beat me. They'll spit, spit on me. They'll kill me. And by the way, on the third day, I'll rise again. It's not the first time he talked about his death and his resurrection. It's a sobering time. Now, right after he says this, we find verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want to do for you, want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do? They said, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. I wonder, did Jesus ever scratch his head? Because that is definitely a head scratcher. He is, he's just gone through with them. What's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem? They're on this sobering journey. There weren't any jokes told, I don't think. Uh, uh, there were no talks about what they were going to do next month on vacation. Everything was focused towards Jerusalem and, and, and the weightiness of it, the weightiness on Jesus. And then he tells them what's going to happen. And the first thing out of their lips is a question that is self-serving and self-focused. Can we be the two most important guys in your kingdom, Jesus? Could that be possible? They were so, con so concerned about their well-being, their future and their glory, they didn't even react to what Jesus said. Self-centeredness, listen, will always lead us to self-serving questions. What about us, they said. For you and I, it could be, what about me? What about me? What's going to happen to me? How's it going to be for me? Self-centeredness leads to self-serving questions, and we've got to look at our own self and ask Jesus, Jesus, does this operate in my life? Is self-serving operate in my life? And I would like to say that it never operates in my life, but then I'd be lying. I think it's something that we always have to be alert to and aware of. I wonder for the disciples, though, wouldn't the better question have been, Jesus, how can we help you? Jesus, what do you want from us? Jesus, is there anything that we can do? You don't hear them say anything like that. It's Jesus. Can we have the left and right side of you when you're in your kingdom? You know, I, as I look in Scripture, we see the first case of the self-absorption in the Garden of Eden. When Satan tempts Eve with the fruit, he tempts her with the benefit it will be to her. He says, God is trying to keep something wonderful from you. It will make you wise, hisses the serpent. You will know the difference between good and evil. You'll be just like God. I don't know, you may not see the connection, but I see a connection with that Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. No, thank you. I don't want to do it my way. Because this is what Scripture says in Proverbs 14, 12, that there is a way that seems right to a man. 
but it ends in death. Seemed like a good idea. You ever said that? When, when something crashes and burns? Seemed like a good idea to me. I'm the only one. <laughs> there have been numerous times it seemed like a good idea, but it didn't turn out so well. Why? Well, probably two things. I didn't ask God. I didn't run it past my wife. I just did it. I learned at an early age. How early? Well, Lori and I have been married since nursery or something. We've been married so long we were just kids. And uh, um, uh, 21 and 18 to be exact. I was 18, she was 20. No, no, it was the other way around. <laughs> the other way around. And, and uh, this was within the first year of our marriage, maybe the first six months of our marriage, and I come cruising home in a, in, in a car that I just bought. It was a 1960 Volkswagen, chopped as a, a, a Baja bug, uh, a rag top, pancake engine in the back, six volt system, if you guys know what that is. When your battery dies, you hook it up to a 12 volt system, it goes, it's just ready to take off just then and there. I come cruising home in this thing, and Lori says, huh? What have you got there? I don't remember all of her reaction, but it was, uh, it would have been nice if we'd have talked. This thing was a money pit. <laughs> Every time I turned around, something broke. The best day that I had with that Volkswagen was the day that some poor slob bought it from me. <laughs> but I did it my way. There's a way that seems right to a man. I don't want to go down that route. But Psalm 37, verse 23 through 24 is one of my favorites. It says, the steps of a good man. We could change because it's not, none of these are gender specific. The steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. I don't know that you can be good without being godly. Maybe you can. But all goodness comes from God, which is why I normally quote this verse as, the steps of a godly person are ordered of the Lord. And he, meaning God, delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. My goodness. Here's a good prayer if you don't pray anything else. Lord God, order my steps. D -d Direct the path that you have for me. When we stay on God's path, that is the best path. Anybody ever taken any side trips, off ramps, that just, they just don't end up well? For the rest of my days, I want to stay on the path that he has for me because I've been on those other ones and they weren't good. Well, Pastor, you know, we just have to find our own way. Why do that? That's stupid. Listen to counsel. Don't stick your hand in the fire when somebody before you says, that's going to burn you. I've got to find out on my own. Okay, it can be very, very painful though. The steps of a godly person are ordered of the Lord and then God delights in the way that we walk. I want God to be delighted with the way that I walk. I don't want him shaking his head going, what is wrong with him? As if he didn't know. Because though he fall, though you stumble, though you may have a, I don't know, something happen, because there's nobody that's perfect, that doesn't give us a way out. But as we're walking on the path that God has for us, he says, even if he falls, he won't be utterly cast down because the right hand of God will, will uphold him. As we're walking down the path that God has for us, we're holding on to his hand. Hold tight onto Jesus because no matter what happens in front of you, let me tell you this. I don't care what it is. Coronavirus, the economy, Whatever it is, nothing has the final say but Jesus. Health issues do not have the final say. As I am the, walking down the path God has for me, he's holding me by his right hand. And when I, if, when I stumble, when I trip, when I'm discouraged, when I, I don't know what's going to happen, he will sustain you because he's holding on to your hand and he'll never let go of you. The only one that can remove that is us. Don't ever let go of Jesus. He is so absolutely good. I, going back to Eve for a moment, I think there should have been some questions she'd have been asking when, when uh, Satan offered her the fruit. Most important and not the least is, 
What does God think about this? I think that should be in a question. Here's another question. How will my actions affect my husband and affect my marriage? Let me ask you this, men. Every time you experience temptation, you must ask, if I give in, how will this affect my wife and how will this affect my kids? For surely it will. She may not know anything of what you have done in secret, but her spirit will know. She might not be able to put words to it. How many times have I, have I spoken with couples over the years and the wife senses something and the husband says, you're crazy? A little bit later you find out there was something stirring even though she couldn't put a finger on it, couldn't pinpoint, couldn't give you time and date. Men, consider what you're doing. It will affect your wife. It will affect your children. It will affect your marriage. I can guarantee you that Adam and Eve's marriage was never the same. They had the perfect marriage. So if you think that, especially when you, you know, young people, when, when young people get married, you know, you're different than your parents. They're pretty fouled up, but we're different. Did you, ever, did you ever say that? We're different. And the, and the voice from heaven says, no, you're not. <laughs> and the older you get, you realize you're just broken as they were. But it's what you do with it. It's going to God. He will take every bit of brokenness and put together. Can I give you hope today? If you will let him, he will put together a marriage made in heaven. He will put together a marriage in your life that you see in others. You don't see their struggles. You only see them when they're on their best behavior. We come to church most of the time on our best behavior. Praise God. It's all going well. Thank you. But God will give you that kind of marriage. I don't care what you've been through. I don't know how you first came together. I don't care the brokenness of relationships in the past. If you will allow him, if you will press on to God, the steps of a godly person are ordered to the Lord. If you will walk down that path, even though sometimes you may not want to, he will bring healing to you and to your wife, and he will give you a marriage made in heaven. And if your kids have gone sideways, you continue to walk with God, you continue to cry out, he will hear your prayers, and he will touch your children. There's, time is never too late. Frankly, Adam should have been asking the same questions as Eve was. What does God think? How will this affect my marriage? He didn't ask those questions. I, do you ever wonder about these things? I, I wonder periodically. What if Eve says, hey, honey, this is really good. Why don't you try this? What if Adam would have said, wait a second, wait a second. Let's check with God on this. What would have happened? I do not know. What would have happened after Adam ate it and they, they were hiding in the garden and God came and said, what have you guys done? Instead of, instead of trying to divert responsibility onto somebody else, God, it's the woman you, you gave me. Remember, you gave me to her. I was fine without her. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He was a lonely, miserable man. <laughs> What, what if Adam had said, God, we have, Father, we have fouled up. We have fouled up. We have messed up the plan. Lord, I don't know what to say. It was us. We did it. Would you forgive us? Would you forgive us? What, what would have happened? I, I don't know because it didn't happen. But I, I guarantee you this. If we will take responsibility for the things that we do, there is forgiveness to be found, there is restoration to be found, but as long as in our lives we try to make excuses, blame somebody else for what's going on in our lives, you'll never find healing, you'll never find wholeness, and sir, so you'll ask all the time what, to your wife, what is wrong with you, or vice versa? And it's not them. It's not them. It's you. That's just a side note. Let me just continue. Uh, you guys are getting real quiet now, so uh, uh, if I've offended you at all, please uh, call the office. <laughs> Speak to Gabby. She takes all of my, all of my hate mail and, and things. So, Verse 38, chapter 10 of Mark. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. 
Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? What was that cup? That was a cup of suffering. It wasn't a cool drink. And what was the baptism? It wasn't a nice, cool... Well, actually, it's warm when we set up our baptismal here. It was a nice water with that, but it was a baptism by fire. Are you willing to suffer and go through fire like I am? And they said, we are able. They had no idea what that would look like. And Jesus said to them, you'll indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism that I'm baptized with, you'll be baptized. But to sit on my right hand on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it was prepared. And it's true, they did drink of those things. James was the first martyr in the church, if you read in the book of Acts. He was the first Christian to be killed after Jesus. John, they tried to kill. Uh, history and tradition tells us that they, they tried to boil him in oil. Now, that could not be fun. But he didn't die. And so they exiled him to Patmos. And he could have been singing the song, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. I've been through so much. While he's on the Isle of Patmos, you read in the book of Revelation chapter 1, on the Lord's day, Jesus comes and lays out this revelation of the future, of the present and the future uh, to him that we have to this day. They did drink of that cup and were baptized by that fire. But it's possible, even with Jesus' discourse, that James and John were fast forwarding. He went through this whole thing of what was going to happen to them. Yes, he was going to be killed but he'll rise again. So their thinking may have very well been, well, then his kingdom is going to come at that point. We're going to kick the Romans out of Israel. He's going to set up his kingdom here. Everything's going to be, going to be great. And probably we should secure for ourselves an important uh, position in the administration before those other ten guys do. I wonder if that was in their heart. But I can almost guarantee you this. Uh, I wonder if it broke Jesus' heart. They aren't asking about him. They aren't ask, they're asking for themselves, and they're asking the wrong questions. I thought about this, and unless this sounds self-serving at all, and if it does, please forgive me. Again, send your questions and complaints to Gabby. But... Years ago when, again, Lori and I were quite young, we've been here at Rancho Christian Center for, uh, uh, I think, uh, 40 years. And um, uh, Pastor Dave and Viv would always ask, how are you? How are you? And he said one time, I don't know if we were in a meeting or where we were, he said one time, nobody ever asks how we are. And I let, you probably heard the story because he's told the story without mentioning my name. But I said to him, what? Ask you how you are? Well, well, you guys have, now this is how I thought as, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s. Really wise and mature. I, I thought you guys, I thought it was always good for you guys. I thought we're the only ones screwed up. He goes, and, and I learned at that point to ask my pastors, how are you? How are you? And to pray for them. It was, uh, uh, <laughs> our pastors have had to teach us how to care for them and how to care for pastors. Because it's not just for them. He's teaching us long range how to care for those in authority over us. They, they, life doesn't always go perfectly well. Please, if I might say, I had a friend send me a, a video this week and the importance of praying for pastors. Uh, Lori and I watched it, and uh, they're absolutely right. Pray for your pastors. Pray for Apostle Dave, Pastor Vivian. Pray for Lori and I, Bob and Linda, Tom and Ileana. Pray for the other pastors in the Rim churches. If, if you're in a home group, and I hope you are, pray for your home group leader. Pray for all of those who, who serve in this house, uh, the, the youth ministry, worship ministry, whatever it might be. Pray for them. Because there's many things that come against them because even Jesus said, strike the shepherd and you'll scatter the sheep. You read about that all the time, a, a, a pastor getting involved in something. Pray for those that are in authority over you. 
A little further in Mark, we find someone asking the right question. We're still in Mark 10, verse 46. We read that they came to Jericho. Now they're still on this journey. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude were with him. And blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. Well, that has to be discouraging. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise. He's calling you. <laughs> it just kills me. First, these guys are going, Shut up, you blind guy. It's Jesus coming by. Jesus stops and goes, Come on over here. Hey, good news, man. Jesus wants you. Here, I'll go along with you. Maybe we'll hang out together. I mean, I don't know, just, just a side note. It irritates me. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Wow, we're supposed to ask the right questions, but Jesus asked us questions. What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabboni, teacher, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. At first glance, it would look like both questions are selfish and self-serving, but they're not. The first question was based upon self-promotion. What do we get out of it? The second was a question based out of just dire need, dire human need. A blind man, reduced to begging, was asking Jesus for his sight. Even as he had to endure ridicule and shame from others, he continued to cry out, even though there are those who say, shut up. Don't any, let anybody tell you to quit pursuing God. Don't let anyone tell you to quit crying out to God. He hears and he answers your prayers because he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. I want you to know that our cries get God's attention. Emily, every time you've cried out to God, he's heard you, even though sometimes it may have not seemed that way. He's heard every cry, he's held every tear, and he will answer the things that you're asking in the deepest places of your heart. Be assured and be confident of that. Ileana, please don't think because he hasn't answered your question as a yes, that he doesn't care. And I, I wondered this as I looked at this bit of scripture. I wondered, how many of us are blind and reduced to begging when it comes to God? I mentioned earlier about this. When, when Bartimaeus came to Jesus, first thing he did was throw off his beggar's clothes. And he physically moved to where Jesus is where Jesus was. We can stay wrapped up in our beggar's clothes and stay where we are singing the woe is me's when Jesus is calling us forward. Whenever Pastor Dave will preach, be one of the, one of the other pastors, and, and you hear something like, who will rise to go where Jesus is going? Now, you might just think that he's just saying, it's just a metaphor. He's just throwing out a, uh, a question. <laughs> Years ago, I would be like this, rise. I hear that. Anyone else rise? You've never done that. Anyone else rising? I said it a second time. Any more when, when I hear something. Who will rise and walk where Jesus is going? Who will throw off their beggar's clothes? I want to be the first one up. If I'm the only one standing up and everyone else, everyone else goes, what is wrong with him? I'll try to explain later if you'll come and see me privately. What is wrong? Nothing is wrong. Bartimaeus threw off his beggar's clothes and he moved to where Jesus was. He threw off that which identified him as a beggar. And as I mentioned earlier, doubt and unbelief are the beggar's garments. How many of us are still blind and wearing beggar's garments when Jesus wants to give us sight? But he's asking us even, 
Ask the right questions. Come to where I am. Come into my presence. The thing is, he couldn't see. All he could do is hear Jesus' voice. Scripture says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. May I ask us, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're having trouble seeing God, seeing what he's doing, understanding why he isn't answering your prayers, then may I say, listen to his voice and go to the sound of his voice. His voice is heard every time you open up the word of God. His voice is heard every time you come into a, an assembly of believers and the word of God is preached. His voice is heard every time worship is going up. And may I say to you, jump into the river immediately. Don't wait for anybody else. No one's raising their hands. Who cares? This time is between you and God. You and God. I want them to go to the presence of God, but he's calling me. He's calling me. We've got to be quick. We've got to be quick to do that. We are in a time and a year of clarity and renewed vision. You will see as you draw near to him. Draw near to him and you will see him clear and clear and clear. But you got to move. You got to move and draw near to him. And he will. He will reveal himself. He will touch you right where you're at. But I don't believe that you can come to Jesus with beggar's clothes on. You've got to ditch those things. You've got to ditch doubt and unbelief. You've got to put on the garments of worship and praise. And with those garments come that nice outer cloak of faith and love. In the presence of God, there is no doubt and unbelief. There's only faith. There's only the power of his presence. Doubt and unbelief are like to faith what the, what, what, you know how it is when magnets, when you push them together and they push one another away? Doubt and unbelief pushes away, pushes us away from the resource we need in our life. The resource that we need above everything else is his presence. And his presence will be there as we throw those things aside. And may I say, even as we ask the right questions. What are the right questions to ask God? And I'm going to close with this. If you don't know Jesus, the most important question is, what must I do to be saved? What does it take? Acts chapter 2, Peter answered this question, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in Him. Believe is not just intellectual assent. Believe means to rely on, cling to, and trust in. It's your whole self. How about another question? In Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, further up in the chapter than we went, verse 17 is the encounter with the rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Good question. Jesus said, you do all these things. The young man said, I, I did all those. He says, trying to justify himself. I did all those. And Jesus looked on him with love and said this, you lack one thing. You know, a good question to ask, and I ask this a lot over the years, Jesus, what now do I lack? What do I lack? Well, I don't want to ask that because he might tell me. Okay, okay, I get it. But I want to be where he is. Well, that's because you're a pastor. No, I'm a desperate man. That's all. Just a desperate man. I want to be where Jesus is. Let me give you a couple more questions. Jesus, how can I draw closer to you? Good question. And then this one here. Jesus, what would you say to me? See, I have found this. I won't go into all the details, but I found this over the years when I've been sick or something bad has gone on or I've been laid out for some reason. I ask him, Jesus, what would you say to me in this place? Because he wants to speak. I, I don't ask anymore. And I, by faith, I'm going to say, by his grace, I pray never to utter this out of my mouth again. Why me? But I pray that for the rest of my life, and I want to encourage you, the question to ask, no matter what is going on, no matter how difficult, no, no matter how unjust, no matter how unfair, Jesus, what would you say to me in this place? 
I've never asked that question where he has not answered. And the answer is life-giving. I was uh, listening to a song on YouTube just, uh, I think it was Friday. And there's a comment section oftentimes. And a man wrote these words. He said, about a year ago, my wife left me and took the kids. I was in a deep depression and I questioned why. I was mad at God for letting this happen. After three weeks of praying and asking God, why? Why me? Why did you let this happen? He answered me, to, me and said, where were you? When I heard that, I fell on my knees asking for forgiveness and started praying, God, I need you more. My depression started to break. 21 days I spent in prayer and in worship. He's turned my life completely around. I give God all my praise. The right questions will get the right answers. And it will lead to our freedom. It will lead to our deliverance. It will lead to all that God wants to do in our life. And you'll wonder, why didn't I ask these questions before? He's so good. He's so good. Today I want to pray for you and, and ask if there's any of these things that you're struggling with. Would you receive the prayer now? And if you'd like prayer later, that's fine too. But would you put out your hands and say, Lord Jesus, ooh, that was fairly quiet. We got to make sure you hear, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, offer to you I offer to you any place in my life, in my life where I'm still wearing beggar's clothes. Wearing beggar's clothes. Fill, me Fill me with the faith of the Son of God. Son of God. I cast away those clothes they will not identify me. But faith in the Son of God is what I want to be identified with. Glorify yourself in me, O God. What would you say to me today? Heavenly Father, as we've asked those questions, Lord God, made those declarations, I pray, Lord God, that you would answer. That, Father, we would be a people of hope a people of prayer, a people of joy, a people of praise, no matter what is going on when others say, oh, do you see what, how terrible things are? That we would come to them with a word of hope, a word of peace, because we are walking in the hope and the peace of Jesus. Father, touch us to this day. Help us to ask the right questions, Lord. And as we ask, speak to us, we pray. We give you all glory and honor and praise. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. amen.